Welcome everyone, bienvenue, bienvenue à Explore France Live. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, let me see who is tuning in today. And for those who are tuning us, tuning in with, with, with us for the first time, welcome to Explore France Live, the live where we're discovering France uh, from renowned sites to off the beaten uh, track so uh we are here with let me see who is here with us bonjour bonjour uh say bonjour in the comments bonjour sharon uh the new jersey bonjour chéri thank you for joining us bonjour connie how oh, california thank you for joining us oh from holland hi rob so good to see you all Hi from Shanghai. That that is fantastic. Uh, hello, Pansy. Wow. So we have here people having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This is fantastic. Hi, Lori. How are you doing? Hello, George. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for for being with with us today uh, for a, a new episode. So today. Um, Today is a, a day we're going to talk about a place that uh, I really um, I'm excited about to share. We are going to back to Normandy and we're visiting the World War II Museum. Uh, this museum was built right above a former German HQ and is located at the heart of the Normandy region, just a few miles away from the landing day beaches. So uh, the Memorial Museum is located in Caen, uh, in Normandy, and um, it commemorates World War II war, uh, and the Battle for Caen, sorry. It is uh, dedicated to the history of the 20th century and mainly focuses on the fragility of peace. Uh, so the, this museum has a fantastic history and I think the best person to talk about it is our host today. Um, let's uh, welcome our host, Olivier Pizimenti uh, from the Memorial de Caen. Bonjour, Olivier. Bonjour, Tiana. Hello there. How are you Hello. doing? Everyone is great. Uh, so we are. We have here uh, friends uh, from all over the world. We have. Uh, I don't know if you heard me, but we have people from Ireland, yeah. from Florida, from Los Angeles. Yes. Yeah, so we, yeah. So we're we're really excited to be here with you in in Normandy uh, today, Olivier. And so am I. It's such a beautiful day, sunny day. Absolutely. What time is sunny, it? It's sunny in Amandi. It's uh, 5.35 uh, right now. Sun is still out, so just fantastic. Seems that the summer never ends in Amandi, which is great for today. Yes. So tell us, uh, where are we and what is uh, the plan for the visit today? Well, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Tiana, uh, I've been told that I need to uh, tell uh, my very first word in French. We have some French followers on Facebook, on our Facebook account. So uh, just 10 seconds, I'll be right back in English. You okay with that? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, donc ce message s'adresse à tous les Français qui nous écoutent sur la page Facebook. Uh, on va évidemment, comme vous l'avez compris, switcher en anglais pour la prochaine heure et on sera de retour avec vous uh, plus tard. Ceux qui uh, uh, veulent suivre en anglais, évidemment, vous êtes uh, les bienvenus pour nous suivre. Et voilà. Thank bon, you. Uh, Tiana Yes, yeah, so um, I was uh, I was asking about you know where you you're standing right now and what you're planning to show us today. Well, uh, according to what you just said earlier, you were right. We're just uh, so we're in Caen, Normandy, France. By the way, the correct spelling is C A E N. So the uh, best thing you should do if you just uh, really enjoy that tour, that visit, and you really want to come over and check by yourself how great is this museum is to. Uh, uh is to say Caen. Uh, so i just wanted to uh to give the tip with you because uh, we had uh, over the past few years some concerns with americans who really wanted to uh, visit this museum they were willing they were uh, just uh, excited about this museum and instead of booking a ticket for Caen, they just said uh, hello i'd like to get you ken so you know that ken is very far away from where we are we are just thousand miles away thousand kilometers away from 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 ken so we have uh, nothing festival here 
no red carpet, no palm trees, but a great museum. Uh, if you still cannot picture where we are, we're just a few miles away from the um, uh, landing beaches. The nearest landing beach, by the way, uh, from here is Salt Beach, which is uh, 10 miles away only from, uh, it's actually less than 10 miles away from, from where we are, uh, from Caen. Um, this museum, as you, as you said so well, it was actually uh, built uh, in 1948. Actually, the grand opening ceremony uh, was held on June 6, 1988. Um, was built right above, as you said so well, a German HQ, German headquarters. For your information, the German General Richter um, was uh, there, down below the museum at the time, of course, and from there, believe me or not, but he was able to uh, control uh, the German defenses along the coastline. So the tour we're going to do uh, is basically a different type of tour because if you, I often say to my clients, to the visitors coming over that if you, if you really want to, uh, to make the whole visit of the museum, it may take five, six, seven hours, even a, even a full day if you really want to make it all. As you said so well, this museum is, is not only a World War II museum, it also uh, comprises a, a, a new building. Uh, this building way over there, which is different in shape, uh, it's a circular building, it's a, a circular cinema where a uh, 19 minute long film is shown. Film is about the uh, last hundred days, the last hundred years, I'm sorry. Uh, so it covers the, the, the whole century. And right behind, uh, right behind that building, you have another building, which is about the Cold War period. So that's why uh, I keep saying, I keep telling my clients that if you really want to make it all at your own pace, it would take you uh, something like uh, almost a day. Let's say two and a, two and a half hours, let's say three hours, at least in the World War II section. Uh, an hour in the, uh, in the uh, uh, for watching uh, both films and uh, two and a half hours in the uh, Cold War section. But that's clearly the reason why, uh, of course, we don't have that time. Um, uh, we have only an hour. I think that's what you, uh, you said. It's very hard to negotiate with Tiana, but an hour. Uh, so I'll do my best. <laughs> it will be a different kind of visit, obviously. Uh, what we will do is uh, we will do a little presentation of different uh, i say World War II stuff, World War II artifacts. I uh, have a few words with you about those different artifacts. So we will obviously skip a big part of the, uh, of the museum, but at least you will have a, an idea about what this museum is about. Uh, first of all, uh, if Laura can uh, just, Laura, your filmmaker today, by the way. Good morning, Laura. Uh, good morning, America, and good afternoon, France, of course. <laughs> uh, these are the flags of the different nations that all were involved on D-Day, June 6, 1944, you all know that uh, very specific date. Uh, you might be surprised, of course, you uh, can easily recognize the three uh, main nations, the three main allied nations, such as uh, Great Britain, of course, USA and Canada. But let's talk about uh, this one, Laura, this one right here with the yellow, red and uh, German stripes. This is obviously the one, I guess you did recognize this one. This is the one of Germany. Uh, Germany. Uh, so most of you must be like, well, what, what is it telling? It is indeed the, the flag of Germany. The goal of, of the, let's say, the, the goal, the idea is to remind you that uh, this museum is a peace museum. So we don't want to, our goal is not to, um, how can I say, to emphasize on the uh, great things the uh, allies did during the war or to point out the nasty things the German says did during the war. Uh, this is not our goal. Our goal here is to remind everybody what had happened during the, to, to cover the last century. And of course, uh, we will uh, focus on the, on the second war. Now, this is the front wall and the original building. This one is, was actually uh, officially opened on June 6, 1988. Uh, let's talk about the front wall, first of all, which was done with the famous limestone. Um, it, you might see, uh, thanks to Laura, uh, French sentence. Again, uh, that should be part of my skills, but I can easily translate that for you. It says, uh, uh, with it's like uh, uh, the pain uh, of the suffering broke me. Fraternity is like fraternity, brotherhood revived me. And on the other part of the wall, uh, the, uh, and then for my wounds, uh, for my, uh, yeah, let's say for my wounds, there had sprang a fountain, a river of freedom. Uh, I really love uh, this phrase, this uh, caption, this sentence, because first of all, it's from Paul Doré, a local deputy uh, who was somehow a, um, can I say, uh, a, a local poet as well. He's talking about the city of Caen. Uh, the, the sentence is actually female gender because uh, of the two E at Relevé, for instance. Hope you understand what I'm saying. But this is actually a tribute to the city of Caen. 
and all the different cities that uh, suffered during the war, during 1944. You know, that the city of Caen, and that's one of the reasons this museum was built. Uh, it's a tribute to those different cities. 20,000 civilians were killed during the Battle of Normandy. So this is uh, basically the, uh, the meaning of that sentence. Hope you're all ready. You see, it seems like the, we're still in the summer. We have a lot of visitors today. Um, let me tell you as well a few words about the uh, entrance of the museum. Looks like, it doesn't look like an ordinary uh, entrance. Looks like a break through the Atlantic Wall. This front wall is representing obviously the uh, German Atlantic Wall. I guess you can understand what the uh, Atlantic Wall is. Atlantic Wall was a German fortress built uh, starting from Norway, uh, built all the way, uh, I mean, starting from Norway all the way down to the Pyrenees on the western part of the, the uh, of Europe, and that entrance obviously is symbolizing the breakthrough, uh, the Atlantic Wall, June 6, 1944, of course, when the landing took place. Um, well, Sorry that I should uh, put my mask on. Can you still can you still hear me, Tiana? Yes, perfectly. Thank you so much, um, Olivier. Okay. And uh, I want to tell our friends that uh, this is uh, obviously a very interactive live. So any questions you might have about uh, the 20th century history, uh, our expert here is very knowledgeable. So please don't want to don't, don't hesitate to ask him any question you might have. Right. Over to you. Thanks, Tiana. Uh, now, uh, one of the very first things I should start with is a tribute to the gentleman who was behind the idea of building this museum. Uh, this is him. This is uh, Jean-Marie Giraud. Uh, sad thing in that story that he sadly passed away five years ago, uh, actually six years ago. Uh, time flies. Um, um, he was the gentleman who was uh, behind everything. Uh, in a few words, he was 13 when the war broke out. 1939, you know, that the Germans invaded Poland. This caused uh, both Great Britain and France to enter the war. They had to declare the war uh, to Great Britain two days later. So September the 3rd, this is considered to be the, uh, the war in Europe, the very beginning of the war in Europe. It was 14 when the Germans entered France in May 1940. City of Caen was actually uh, uh, invaded uh, and occupied by the Germans uh, a month later, June the 17th, 1940. Um, and uh, at that time, according to what he said, he still had no idea about what, what war was like. He said the war at, at this time was just a question of a hardship and privation, and that was not a big deal. As long as you behaved well, everything was fine. But according to what he said, four years later, it was different. Uh, di he had a different feeling, obviously. You know that on June 6, 1944, the uh, Allied troops landed in Namendi. Uh, he was actually, uh, at that time, live, he was 18, he was still living in Caen, doing some studies, he was doing, he was doing his studies in law, and according to what he said, there he realized what war was, uh, was like, he said he had to uh, uh, face every day the uh, aerial bombardments, the city of Caen was heavily bombed, I was telling you earlier that this is one of the uh, most affected city. Uh, city of Caen has lost uh, 5,000 of its population. City at the time that uh, were uh, 45, 50,000 people were living at the time. So it has lost uh, something like 10% of its uh, to total uh, habitants. And he said, according to what he said, he just decided to uh, join the uh, Saint Etienne Church, one of the uh, different churches downtown, uh, because th that church was actually turned into a, a net post. And according to what he said there, he saw the uh, different, um, uh, most, most of his relatives uh, wounded, some of them uh, passed away, obviously. And this is something, according to what he said, that he would never forget. Uh, believe me or not, but that gentleman after the war became the new uh, mayor. He was actually remained the senator and the mayor of the city of Caen for uh, 31 years, 1970 through 2001. And he decided to do what he decided to do. One of the very first, uh, his very first idea when he turned to be the new mayor of the city of Caen was to build uh, a place of remembrance, a place to remember. The idea was, first of all, to pay a tribute to the civilians who lost their life uh, during the Battle uh, of Normandy, and also to pay a tribute to those nations like Americans, of course, Canadians, and, uh, and Great Britain who really helped us fight the Nazi Germany. And that's how the idea was born. Of course, I guess you understand that the idea was uh, fantastic. 
uh, but uh, there was still a, 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 how can I say, a big concern at the time, the lack of money, uh, especially uh, since the war was just over. You know, the French, the French economy was very weak at the time. So uh, that's also another reason I would like to thank you all, Americans and Canadians, because you Americans, along with the Canadians, were the very first nations who uh, came into action and really helped us uh, support the construction of, uh, of this museum of food. A big, a big thank you. Bigger for you, Americans. Uh, mm -hmm. Funny thing is that, uh, you know, we are not very far from England, or often considered to be the next door country. We often say that uh, we are cousins. You know, it did take a few years uh, for the English to uh, accept to do the same thing. But anyway, uh, now let me tell you a few words about this. Uh, uh, that could be one, one of the questions, by the way, if any of uh, our Facebook fans can uh, tell uh, what this uh, uh, aircraft, this airplane is. Let's have a let's have a guess. I can carry on talking and uh, and you, Tiana, you will tell me if someone uh, finds out. Yes. Uh, first, if I can have a, Can yep. you give us some hints, though? <laughs> yeah, uh, as you may see, it's an English uh, aircraft. Uh, it seems like one uh, single pilot uh, could actually fit in. Uh, the goal of this, uh, I was about to, to tell the, the name of the uh, of it. Uh, so the goal of this airplane was to destroy the uh, tanks uh, downtown. Uh, that's why uh, actually his nickname was uh, the tank fighter in Caen. Um, and this uh, type of uh, plane really played a, a crucial, uh, a, a, an important role during the Battle of Normandy because what I need to tell you is that during the early days, I mean, right after the, <clears throat> the D-Day landings, uh, the, what, I, what I want you to understand that the supremacy of the ground clearly was German, uh, you know, was German. Uh, I mean, uh, Br the British really had a hard time. Uh, you may know that if, I, if we just talk about the city of Caen where we are, um, the mission uh, fell to Montgomery to capture the city of Caen. Uh, you know who was Bernard Montgomery? He was a British, uh, British leader uh, with great leadership. The uh, mission that fell to him was actually not only to capture the city of Caen, but also to capture the city of Bayeux. So he was supposed to uh, seize those two cities within a day. Um, nearly done for Bayeux because Bayeux fell the next, the very next day after the day, June the 7th. Uh, but uh, let's say that he clearly failed uh, his mission with Caen. It did take more than a month for the Montgomery troops to, uh, to take the city of Caen. And that's clearly one of the reasons he was often criticized. But one of the reasons why he took that... Sorry, we'll have to deal with that. <laughs> So um, we have here a couple of guesses. Sorry, oh, Jimmy. Yes. Yeah, so we have Ravi who says uh, it was if this is a Spitfire. It's or, not. And, and uh, Leslie too guessed the, the Spitfire, and then Paul uh, Paul guessed the Typhoon ground attack. Excellent. Fighter. That's the correct answer. Bravo, Paul. Oh. Okay. Well, you you oh. want an open ticket for the memorial? Oh, I will did be you hear that, guy. Paul? Let's talk a letter, Paul. <laughs> right. So back to what I was uh, telling you. Uh, re one of the reasons why uh, Montgomery was so late is because uh, city of Caen was uh, surrounded by what the uh, German and uh, Br British historians had called the steel rampart. It seemed like the city of Caen was surrounded with a uh, with uh, tanks, t German tank divisions all around the town. The 21st Panzer Division, that was uh, known to be uh, uh, a normal division uh, from the Wehrmacht, a regular army. And uh, the 12th SS, you, know, you all know what SS stands for. I don't speak any German, but SS stands for Schutzstaffel, so just very fanatics and devoted to their men, to their, uh, to their Führer, Adolf Hitler. And this is clearly the reason why it took that long to, uh, first of all, to uh, get close to Caen and then to penetrate, to break through the German defenses. And what I mean that is that without this uh, typhoon, without this uh, uh, American or British air support, I guess that I'm guessing that the, the uh, liberation of Caen, I mean, the battle for the liberation of Caen, the battle for the liberation of Mali, of Normandy would have lasted uh, much longer, probably. So let's carry on. 
So uh, when we go to the next uh, place, I, I just have a couple of questions here for you. Uh -huh. So uh, Dana is asking, um, is, she knows that uh, Josephine Baker was involved in the war. Is there any, inf any information about her in the museum? Yes, uh, in interesting question because Josephine Baker uh, uh, must have, uh, she must have been here twice uh for different uh, ceremonies she was of course uh uh um, one of our vips but yeah she she, she was there uh, after the war and she uh, did the best uh, she could during the during the war to uh, help um to, to help people yes shall we carry on the visit oh yes let's go carry on uh hopefully you uh, can see that uh red cross meaning that this uh, little type of car was uh, used by the uh, red cross services in the media i mean um uh funny f i mean there's nothing funny of at all of course but uh, what i really want to tell you is that this is uh, an italian model car um, um which was actually uh the uh, very uh I can say like, almost like the, the you know the Fiat the Cinque Cento in Italian five, Fiat five five hundred. Uh, this was the Benito Mussolini's idea. His idea was actually to give every single Italian being, every single Italian uh, individual, a chance to of becoming a, a car owner at little cost. Uh, but what is very interesting in that in that car, not only that it was used by the by the Red Cross services, but Adolf Hitler himself was so impressed about the about that car that he would soon ask uh, later ask uh, Ferdinand Porsche uh to design the same uh, the new type the same equivalent of car and that's how right away the uh, very first uh, uh volkswagen models uh, were born uh, now hopefully laura will uh climb up this little step please do not fall and you can then therefore have a look to this uh uh cannon which is an, one of the um how do you say uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh cannon uh entire crowd that could believe me or not that fire more than more than 800 rounds per per, per, per minute uh something unbelievable at the time so needless to say it was particular particularly uh, feared by the by the allied pilots british and american pilots so what the germans did is that they often camouflaged this uh this type of gun in uh, what we call the hedge wars of namendi i don't know if you're familiar with this american uh hedge wars of namendi uh were some fig trees Fig trees that you could just couldn't uh, couldn't see anything through. Uh, Germans actually uh, took advantage of the whole situation. Uh, one of the things I would like to to tell about the uh, the hedgerows of Normandy is that the Germans never planted those trees. That's one of the questions I've been asked uh, uh, very often. Germans never planted those trees. They had been uh, planted here in Normandy. They are part of the uh, what you call the bocage in Normandy. Uh, most of the trees uh, have been planted here for decades and for centuries to, in order to. Uh, protect uh, their dairy cattle from the wind and to enclose, by the way, the, the dairy cattle. But this actually offered the German uh, a, a very nice hideout and the German took advantage of that situation on, on the day and the following days after the Battle of Normandy. So meaning, obviously, many Americans were killed because of those uh, bloody trees. Uh, now, a uh, few words about this uh, acoustic mine right here. This is one of the uh, mines that the Germans dropped from their from their airplanes. A few days after the day, I would say, uh, uh, one or two weeks after the day, it seems that the Germans realized that uh, the landing on the day was not the uh, the only one. They were the, it was just the very first uh, landing of a large series of different landings. So what I mean, what I want you to understand is that a large number of battleships were every single day were landing on there uh, on the Normandy beaches. So in order to hamper, in order to uh, slow down the uh, uh, arrival of those troops, Germans had dropped from the air uh, tens, uh, dozens of uh, acoustic mines like this. Those mines were so uh, well sophisticated that they actually could react to uh, magnetism, they could react to uh, pressure change, they could react even to the sound of the, of the vessel's propellers. Uh, if you want to, uh, if I remember properly, uh, correctly, uh, the third week when they uh, began launch, uh, dropping this type of, this, this type of uh, of mines uh, between the 22nd of June and the 29th of June, within five days, they had uh, already uh, destroyed uh, 25 vessels, uh, 12 uh, in the uh, offshore Borg, 
uh, near Utah, and the rest were destroyed uh, between uh, Gold, Juno, and Salt Beach, in what the uh, English say, uh, English call the um, English Channel. I voluntarily said English called uh, this channel the English Channel. In my mind, there's nothing English in that channel, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> we just say La Manche in French, which is uh, like the sleeve or the name of the department where Utah Beach is uh, located. Few words about this uh, anti tank gun designed in 1938 by the German uh, firm. I uh, don't remember, uh, just came out of my mind the name of that uh, firm. But uh, even though it was designed in 1938, it was actually uh, used in 1941 during the Operation Barbarossa. Uh, Barbarossa was the code name uh, for the uh, invasion of the USSR. You may know that Adolf Hitler wanted a name that could stand out, and he voluntarily picked Barbarossa because Barbarossa was the name of the, the uh, as far as I remember, the very first German emperor uh, back to the 12th century. So this type of gun uh, turned out to be very effective with the uh, medium armor or the small armor, but proved to be very ineffective when the armor was thicker. So it was then uh, little by little uh, removed. And uh, uh, it was not, uh, in 1944, we, uh, there was, it was not very unusual to find this, this type of, uh, this type of um, anti-tank gun. Now let's... Uh, Olivier, I think we, we lost um, the sound. Sorry. Apologies. Olivier. Um, I think we've lost your sound, Olivier. Ol I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, we just have um, lost briefly Olivier's sound, but we, I'm sure we'll be back briefly. Thank you so much for uh, bearing with us, and uh, I hope you're you're enjoying the beautiful view of um, of the the memorial. So. Um, it, in the meantime, I just want to answer a couple of questions that I saw in the in the comments. So, um, Paul, um, Paul, uh, Paul asked about a couple of uh, World War II museums and attractions nearby. Uh, oh, I think they are back. Um, Olivier, let us know when you when you're ready to to be to be uh, back on, but. But um, I just wanted to mention that, as uh, as Olivier mentioned, there are. Uh, uh, Olivier, I think you're back on. Can you hear me? Olivier, can you hear me? Oh, so 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 sorry, guys. Um, the the gods of uh, technologies when are uh, yeah. It happens. Thank you so much for uh, bearing with us. <laughs> so yes, I was mentioning. Of course, you can visit uh, the 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 landing um, the landing uh, beaches right there uh, that are just a few miles away. And then uh, I see some of our uh, friends here also mentioning um, beautiful places to visit, like Bayeux. Uh, Joe um, recommended and. Uh, yes, I think you know you you could definitely. Um, it's just a few few miles away. Uh, Mary recommended Enfleur, and of course uh, um, there is also the impressionist um, uh, side of Normandy that's also beautiful to visit there. So uh, th th there is so much you can do uh, and and uh, around around the area of Caen. So. Um, Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Glennis was um, yes, saying the the landing landing places are are uh, amazing too. So um, 
I think they should be back with us uh, shortly. Oh. Uh, yes. I think. I hear you. Yes. Can I hear you hear me perfectly? Yeah. Great. I don't know what happened. Oh, it was probably just you know uh, technology. That's um, yeah. that's what happened. It's beautiful at the same time for us to be to be live with you at the sundown in uh, in in Normandy. But but you know it's uh, some, sometimes <laughs> it can be um, it can be tricky. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, so shall uh, we carry on? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, well, what I was uh, talking was uh, I was uh, about to pay a tribute to uh, an English citizen. He was actually an English engineer living in the uh, Yorkshire, northern part of England. His name is Donald Bailey, and he's the gentleman who designed this new type of, uh, of bridge uh, in 1941 in order to make up for so many bridges having been destroyed uh, all over Europe and in, in northern Africa. He designed this new type of bridge that could be pretty much in the same way as a uh, reassemble uh, as a mechano, mechano model, as a mechano set. Uh, particularly that all the components were made of uh, steel, like pins, like uh, uh, balls, rivets. So it, it then uh, offered a, a large uh, va variety, a large array of uh, different parts, of different uh, constrictions. Uh, this one, for instance, uh, is actually one that was uh, rebuilt, uh, of course, sp specifically for 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 for, the, for this museum. But let me tell you that only 50 men and four hours were uh, necessary to rebuild to set up a 25 meter long bridge. And once completed, a 40 ton uh, tank or 40 ton truck, whatever, uh, could actually uh, use that uh, that bridge. I mean, the bridge was uh, capable of uh, withstanding of supporting one of those uh, those tanks. Uh, uh, Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander, or Ike, that's the nickname he was uh, given uh, during the war, he uh, once said that this uh, uh, innovation was one of the three greatest uh, innovations uh, at wartime, along with the heavy bombers and the, and the German radars, and, and the radars, I should say, not, not necessarily, German, necessarily German radars. Now, I guess uh, I heard uh, at the very beginning, when you, uh, at the very beginning of the visit, that uh, few there were a few fans from California. I love your, I love your this destination. By the way, I've been there a few times. Uh, so you may know that uh, George Patton, uh, commanding the Third Army, was from there. Uh, this, this is not a, a personal tribute to George Patton, but what I want to um, tell you is that if you Americans are a fan of the uh, Patton's Army, the Third uh, Armored Division, you can actually uh, follow the Liberty Road. Uh, Liberty Road was actually uh, uh, composed, was actually uh, easy to, to follow thanks to those uh, cement stone uh, or stone marker. Uh, you will find one uh, stone marker like this every single kilometer. So we'll start, you'll have to start uh, at Utah Beach where uh, George Patton uh, landed on, on June 6, 1944. Uh, uh, that's a big mistake, by the way. George Patton never landed on June 6, 44. He really wanted, uh, he was craving to, to, take, to lead the troops on the day, but because of his temper, you know that George Patton, uh, you may, may know this, uh, the nickname he was given after uh, during the war by his men, all blood and guts, someone very uh, diffi difficult to deal with. So, uh, be notably because he slapped two soldiers in Sicily with his pair of gloves, he was taken to a military court, and that's clearly the reason why he was uh, dismissed of his function for a while and then missed the D-Day missed the D landings. Instead, he was uh, given a different mission. He was uh, to, to think about the idea of uh, faking the Germans out, make them believe that the landing would take place someplace else. Uh, that's clearly the reason why George Patton uh, did not land on D-Day, but instead he landed uh, one and a half months later, um, uh, almost two months later, the very first day of August 1944 on uh, Utah Beach. Uh, this is it for the, uh, for the different uh, war stuff. One of the last uh, things I would like to tell you before I take you to the um, uh, D-Day room, the room dedicated to D-Day, is that you uh, followers, uh, Facebook followers, uh, will just miss the most important part of the museum. Uh, this is uh, usually where starts the visit. 
Laura will zoom in so that you can have a look at Voyage Historic in French. It's a journey through history. This is basically where the visit starts. Uh, if you're an ordinary uh, client, you're not an ordinary client today, you're extraordinary client. So you won't have to uh, go through this uh, uh, spiral, this chronological spiral. You will skip that part. But again, if you want to uh, check by yourself, you have to, uh, to come and, uh, and, uh, and go there. Uh, the idea is actually to make every single visitor understand uh, the different stages of the evolution of the world. Uh, so we start in 1918. Hopefully, uh, you might have been able to, to watch this. 1918 is uh, considered to be the end of the first war. Uh, so we are doing just the, uh, uh, the aftermath, 10 million people killed. And, def and then from there, we just uh, pass by. I mean, you, if you want to come over uh, and visit this museum, you will pass by the different uh, uh, posters, videos uh, uh, um, from, from that particular time. So we'll start in 1918 and you will end up your visit in 1914, 1944. Uh, this is actually where you will end up your visit, right here. And of course, you will be uh, automatically led to uh, this room, which is called the uh, Dide room. It's a uh, uh, 250 maybe square meter room, which is only uh, dedicated to Dide and the Battle of Namendi. Uh, I have, by the way, a very tricky question for you. Uh, you may know uh, that D-Day uh, landing was on D-Day, uh, June 6, 44. That's the, 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 the date, the exact date. I have a tricky question for you. Uh, do you have any idea about the day of the week? That's the, uh, another question uh, for you, Tiana. So the first correct answer will get, will, uh, will get a, a, an entrance ticket at the museum. All right? Okay, so uh, let's see if any of our friends know which which day the, the, the landing actually happened <laughs> during the week. Does any ha anyone have an idea? Paul, Javi, uh, Leslie, what, what, what do you think? Uh, the actual day of the week, of the week, um, from Monday to, so, uh, okay. Uh, maybe maybe we, we have, can help you out. Yeah, we have Let's a winner here. Javi says, ask if it, is, it was a Wednesday. It was not Wednesday. It was not Wednesday? Oh, yeah, no. Well, sorry, Javi. Uh, Mary, says, Mary says Tuesday. Yeah, that's, no, 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 no. That's no, no, no. the correct answer. Oh, fantastic. Okay. That's good. Mardi, so it was uh, a Tuesday. Yeah, correct answer. Mardi, June 6, 1944. Uh, anyway, this was just a, a tricky question and tricky answer. Now let me uh, have a look at the, uh, let me talk about the five different uh, uh, beaches. Uh, if, just in case guys, you always uh, wondered why and how those uh, names uh, were born, uh, that's something I, I would like to answer <laughs> because uh, sometimes people expect uh, something, uh, you know, extraordinary or something scientific. Uh, it has nothing to do with something uh, extraordinary. Uh, mission fell to Eisenhower. You know that Ike didn't really want to, he just wanted to um, uh, keep off his plan. He didn't want the Germans to find anything uh, relating to the beaches. So his idea was to find some uh, weird names. So the mission fell to his two assistants, uh, Montgomery, uh, who was in charge of gold, Juno and sword, uh, and then Bradley for the Americans, Omar Bradley, the four star general. So let me uh, start first with uh, Montgomery. Montgomery was, uh, Montgomery's idea was first to uh, name the three uh, English and Canadian beaches, goldfish, jellyfish, and swordfish, and then he dropped the, the fish. That's how the names were uh, almost born. Uh, uh, there was still, however, some concerns with the Canadians. Canadians had the feeling that uh, it was a bad omen uh, to name uh, a Canadian beach uh, jelly. Jelly doesn't seem to be very, uh, very sexy. So uh, the Canadian wing commander, along with uh, Keller, who was supposed to lead the troops on, on, on the Canadian beach, uh, just wanted to turn the, the jelly into something different. Uh, the answer was yes, they were allowed to do that. So what uh, Keller and uh, the wing command decided to do was to uh, use the, the, the name of uh, uh, of the wife of the wing commander, she was named Junian, 
so his, since her nickname was Juno, that's how uh, Jerry was then turned into Juno. That's how the three uh, British and Canadian beaches were born. As for the Americans, same, Omar Bradley did ask his two uh, assistants. One was, uh, the question was, where are you guys from? One said, well, I'm from Utah. Uh, I guess he was uh, from a small town near Salt Lake City, but he did, did not mention that he was from Salt Lake City. So Utah was then uh, uh, taken, uh, chosen. And the other one was, uh, and the other one said, well, I'm uh, from uh, Omaha, Nebraska. That's how the two American names were born. As simple as that. That's a really good fact. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> My pleasure, Tiana. What's the time, most? Oh, 40 minutes? Well, uh, looks like I'm a, a, a bit talkative. We are running out, we're running late, but we had a five minute long break, so that might be the reason. Uh, we are now, uh, we just entered the DD room, and I wish I could start with a brief presentation of these uh, uh, personalities, those big heroes, really a big bunch of heroes. Let's start first with Ike. I've been talking about Ike since the very beginning of this. Uh, this is a gentleman since the very beginning of this tour. He's flanked on his left by Montgomery. That's the uh, British, British general. Then uh, there is Leigh Mallory right next to him, uh, who was in charge of the uh, Air Force. And he's what we call his uh, chief of staff right there. And uh, that's the famous Omar Bradley, who was in charge of the uh, US troops uh, on the D-Day landings. Uh, I love uh, this photograph. If yeah. If you could back up a little bit, Laura. Thank you, Laura. I love this photograph because it uh, depicts the uh, famous room, the, the D-Day room uh, near Portsmouth uh, in the library. It's like a, uh, in the South Wick, very, uh, very close to Portsmouth, where that picture taken. And that picture was actually taken just a couple of hours uh, before Eisenhower pronounced his famous let's go. You know, uh, you may know that the very first landing was supposed to take place on, uh, uh, most people say on June the 4th or June the 5th, which is wrong. The very first landing, the D-Day landing was supposed to be, was supposed to take place in early May, but because of the progress of the troops, of the Allied troops in Italy, they had to postpone it for four months. Then June the 4th and June the 5th were the two opportunities. You know that uh, some conditions had to be uh, uh, reunited like the uh, full moonlight condition that was in order to ease the um, the, the task of the paratroopers uh, a, a long day that's why uh, you know mid mid june or early may where we are the, the the best uh, days ever uh, so this is anyway when uh, ike uh, when this picture was taken just a few minutes before uh, just a few hours before I pronounced his famous let's go. Uh, one of the figures I would like to tell you, the very last man he uh, he saw and the very last meeting he had in this room was with the meteorologist, uh, the, that guy who said that uh, uh, a, a landing was very uh, premature. Uh, it would be very risky to land uh, in Namandi on, on June the 5th or, or June the 6th. But that same guy uh, went back to the same office and, and told uh, Eisenhower that uh, although the, uh, the next 48 hours would, we, were going to be uh, uh, very uh, very risky, uh, there was still a six hour long uh, lull, a six hour long window that allowed the troops to uh, to land in uh, safer conditions because the uh, because the weather uh, was going to be. Uh, a little bit better. That's uh, that's the uh, that's the uh, last meeting he had. Yeah. Now, uh, um, Olivier, just just uh, um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, uh, no problem. Marianne uh, earlier actually was uh, mentioning it in in the comment, and uh, this funny you you're uh, mentioning it here. She, so she says though that the, it was um, the Republic of Ireland who was neutral who gave the weather forecast to the uk embassy wow absolutely excellent <laughs> excellent thanks for thanks for joining us and participating and uh, helping do my job <laughs> um well loha uh, is now filming the different names of the beaches and i guess you uh, hopefully you can see the, the the timing it seems that you americans again were supposed to land first you see that omaha utah landing was supposed to take place at 6 30 and the landing on the uh, British and Canadian forces was scheduled for uh, 7.25, 7.30. So you American or, or other uh, people in the world in Europe might be wondering why, 
why did the US was supposed to land first and why did the British and the Canadians were to wait an hour? And uh, this was in order, um, how can I say, this was in order to compensate for the differences in tight times along the coast. Uh, you may know that on D-Day, you may know that on D-Day, it was absolutely vital uh, to land at low tide. The idea was not to repeat the same mistake, mistake that had happened in Dieppe two years uh, before, two years prior to the D-Day landings. Uh, Winston Churchill was behind that. Uh, he sent uh, 6,000 men. His idea was just, uh, it was like almost like a rehearsal to test the German, uh, German defenses. He knew that he was fully aware that for the operation of a law to succeed, they really needed a port. So what Winston Churchill decided to do was to make a, a uh, was to at least to try to capture a port by a frontal assault. So 6,000 men, they were, I must say, mostly Canadians. There were a few Americans as well, in a, a few uh, English and a, and a handful of American soldiers. The mission that fell to those men was to uh, uh, land on Dieppe. Uh, you, just in case you, uh, you don't know, you cannot picture Dieppe, Laura will uh, help you uh, locate uh, Dieppe. This is uh, right here where is Dieppe. Uh, so it's like in uh, Upper Normandy. We are right now in the Lower Normandy. And you see that Dieppe is not that far from the, uh, from the, um, from the uh, English coastline. So the reason, why, uh, the reason why so many Canadians lost their life on Dieppe uh, is uh, twofold. First reason is because they all landed at high tide. And what I mean by that is that most of the German obstacles were actually uh, underwater, so they could not be seen. Most of them were like a, a concrete triangle with a T-man on the top. They were designed to rest on a sea bottom, but every single, every single uh, concrete uh, triangle was uh, mined on its top. And they were obviously designed to, to blow up the landing boats. And that's how, and that's the reason why clearly so many Canadians lost their life on, on the app. And the second reason is because they landed, they landed uh, in front of a port. And a port at that time, 1942, all the ports had been turned into uh, very terrible fortresses. So Winston Churchill, uh, you know how the English media can be uh, sometimes. They were, they can be very tough, can be very, uh, very sticky. He was pretty much criticized, but he said, well, we have learned something. Remember that this was just a test. We have learned something. Um, next time we will have uh, to uh, bring our own port. And the reason why I wanted to share that story with you is because this really, um, uh, this really uh, is the reason why uh, the uh, English engineers have built two ports on D-Day. I mean, prior to D-Day landings, it took 18 months to design and to build the famous mulberries mulberry were the code name given to the uh, given to these ports uh now a uh, few uh are you still here i, I, I cannot yes. hear you Tiana. you're still okay no. yes very uh, much enjoying we, uh, this tour <laughs> excellent are we still on time uh we are um if we are uh, running we out are behind scale you just tell me Yes, we can we can uh, we can move on photo. to the w whichever place you want to show us. Okay, um, maybe this one. That's one of the uh, one of the pictures I like the most in a museum. One of the uh, greatest pictures ever. If Laura can just zoom in on the face of that gentleman, uh, I don't know what you what is your feeling, but when I first saw that picture, I had the feeling. As you can see, he's not a European. He's a uh, he's a, 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 a Korean. Uh, and if you, I think that's, that's okay. Thank you, uh, Laura. Uh, when I first saw that picture, I had the feeling that this guy was a teen. He was 14 or 15 years old. But believe me or not, when that picture was taken, that picture, by the way, was taken on June 6, 1944 on Utah Beach, where the 4th Infantry Division landed among, uh, those men and someone, uh, who really led the troops on the day was, uh, Teddy Roosevelt Jr the son of the 18th U.S. president and a nephew of the, uh, of the president in 1944, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who is buried, by the way, in Namandi. Uh, another reason why uh, you should come over and visit uh, both this museum and the U.S. cemetery. But back to this gentleman, uh, I did tell you when this picture was uh, taken, he had already been fighting for 10 years. Uh, first, uh, he fought uh, with a Nippon flag on his uniform, although he was a Korean, but he was fighting in Mongolia, at the time, the USSR wanted to take over, wanted to invade Mongolia. Uh, he was captured by the uh, Red Army, who that puts him into its ranks. Three years later, three, four years later, he was then captured by the Germans during the, remember, the Operation Barbarossa, when the uh, Germans uh, 
uh, invaded with more than 3 million people uh, the USSR. Uh, he was then captured by the Germans, who uh, in turn decided to do the same thing. He was then conscripted, he was then forced to fight this time for the German army. And guess what, on June 6, 1944, June 6, 1944 I'm sorry, uh, early in the morning, he was captured by elements of the 4th Infantry Division. He ended up in a camp, you know, uh, uh, in a camp, in a camp of prisoners, uh, I'm not saying a death camp, and then returned uh, home uh, safe after the war, way after, way long, long, long time after the war. That's, I guess, is an extraordinary story. It is. Uh, now, let me uh, show you. We still have uh, 10 minutes, something like this. Yes, sounds good. So we're, we're good. We're, we're on time. Uh, just wanted to, uh, you to have a look at this uh, different type of uh, guns. This one, obviously, not this one. Uh, this, actually, they are both the same, but this one, uh, looks different, uh, shape looks different because it obviously was uh, recovered uh, way after the uh, June 6th, long time after the day. Uh, you know that in Amandi, I was telling you earlier that we have some uh, uh, tight times and sometimes the coefficient of the tide is very is very big, so things like this can be uh, washed up on the shore. So we uh, just collect, well, it's just a loan, of course, from, uh, from the private, so we're very happy with that. But this is uh, a, uh, um, how can I say, um, English uh, uh, rifle. You uh, may have uh, heard of uh, the, some of the work photographers that were uh, here on D-Day. Uh, these are some of the photos, some of the pictures that were taken by Bob Kappa. I'm not talking about uh, Frank Kappa, the movie director. I'm just talking about Bob Kappa, who was hired by the Life magazine, the US Life magazine. These are for the 11 pictures that survived. You may know that picture, Kappa, according to what he said, landed early in the morning, was probably the only American landing with the uh, big red one, one of the two infantry div divisions that landed on Omaha Beach uh, on the day. That division, unlike the 29th, was composed of very experienced element. He landed right below the cemetery, where the cemetery is today. And according to what he said, he took over 120 different pictures. Uh, but back in London, uh, pictures, uh, were given to his young assistant and according to what the media had said it seemed that because of his uh, of a mistake of the young assistant 11 pictures survived only so this probably uh, uh, turned those pictures so 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 famous I was earlier uh, telling you the reason why this museum was built it's a place of remembrance uh, the idea is to remember uh, what you Americans did to help us fight the Nazi Germany and the uh, second idea is to uh, pay a tribute to the cities like Caen, like Saint-Lô, like Cherbourg, like Le Havre, that were just uh, wiped out. It seems like 25% uh, only of the town was still, uh, uh, was still standing. The rest of the, of the town was just uh, wiped out. That's the word I was using. The uh, city of Caen was uh, heavily bombed. And that's one of the uh, uh, main streets, picture of the, one of the main streets downtown. I guess, and hopefully that gives you an idea about what uh, life was like at that time. Um, now, if Laura can just zoom in, this is one of the four or six millimeter, uh, how can I say, shell, uh, four or six like, uh, millimeters, like 40 centimeters uh, wide. That's one of the shells that managed to hit the bell tower downtown. So for your information, believe me or not, but uh, you know that coin is 10 miles away uh, from the from the from the shore that ship the rodney which is an english battleship managed to uh, hit the bell tower 36 kilometers away it's like uh, 22 miles something like this 22 miles away uh this hopefully this uh, uh fragment of shell is actually uh, i'm not saying this is the one that hit the bell tower but this is uh, if you want to see how big it is on the scale of my hand that's uh one of those uh, four or six millimeter shell that hit uh, that was uh targeting the, the bell tower. I must tell you that uh, uh, in the early days of the Battle of Normandy, many Germans, uh, not, not necessarily German snipers, but the German who were in charge of the transmissions and the communications were positioned on the bell tower. The idea was to uh, overlook the whole thing and, uh, and give the uh, positions of the, uh, of the enemies. So no, no wonder why those uh, um, bell towers were voluntarily locked off. 
Uh, another uh, great story I would like to share with you and a big up for the Canadians who, along with the Canadians, were the very first to uh, enter the city of Caen. Those three men, uh, very likely from three different regiments, uh, entered the city of Caen from the west, N13, that means they came from the west. Um, that picture was taken on July the 9th, uh, meaning one uh, month and three days after the uh, estimated date. Remember that Montgomery was supposed to capture the city of Caen within a day. Uh, that picture was taken on July the 9th. Believe me or not, and that's the uh, the best part of the of my speech today. Uh, message of hope. Uh, those three Canadians went through the war. They returned home safe. Safe, and guess what? 19, uh, for, 1984. So 40 years later, those three gentlemen came back here for the um, uh, for the exact same picture at the exact same spot. Looks like the road sign is slightly different, but this is the exact same spot. 40 years later, those three Canadians returned. So this is uh, one of the pictures I wanted to share uh, with you as well. Uh, that's one of the uh, extraordinary stories that I wanted to, uh, to, to share with you. Uh, I still have a few uh, words to share with you, uh, Tiana. Yes, and, please. And you'll this be done with a, me. Yes, this is a very enjoyable visit. And um, yes, a lot, every, everybody is so... I think, you know, I want to share some of the comments here. Christina says she is very thankful to learn history through this way. Um, and Janine uh, uh, came to visit uh, the, the museum and she loved it. Um, oh, yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. So every, everybody is enjoying uh, your tour so much. Excellent. Uh, now, what I'd like to uh, talk about is one of the... Uh, uh, this uh, scary uh, weapon, a Russian weapon, that was designed in 1938 uh, by the NKVDs, the former uh, Russian secret police. That same secret police, by the way, that between 1938 and 1941 uh, killed uh, some uh, uh, Polish uh, intellectuals. This order was signed by Joseph Stalin. Uh, I was about to say millions, of course not, but um, uh, thousands of Jewish, uh, of uh, Polish and Jewish intellectuals were murdered by Stalin. Uh, but back to this um, uh, Katyusha. Katyusha is just the name. Uh, it's just the name of a song as well. Uh, after the uh, after after the war, but Katyusha was the name of this uh, rocket launcher. Uh, Katyusha, you may know this is the pet name for Katerina, a very common uh, first name in uh, in the USSR. And that type of gun, believe me or not, it's obvious actually if you uh, have a closer look to this uh, uh, to this um, uh, weapon. Uh, it could fire eight, uh, eight and eight, uh, 16 uh, rockets uh, simultaneously, so something very scary. The German was so scared, by the way, about the, the strident and, the, and the, um, how can I, the scary sound uh, of the uh, rocket fired uh, that they dubbed uh, this uh, weapon um, uh, Stalin's organ, organ of Stalin. And the last, last but not least, uh, this is one of the most common uh, uh, tank uh, between 1941 and 1944, used by the uh, Allies. This is one of the American uh, Sherman tanks, even though this one was actually manufactured in Canada. Uh, but this is one of the uh, very uh, common tank, the M4, M4 Sherman tank, that was a little bit lighter than the, uh, any, uh, any of the, uh, of the uh, German tanks. Most people say that, uh, they could not compare, they, were not, they could not match the, uh, the German tank. It, it is true that the, the armor of the German tank was much thicker, the range was much uh, longer. Um, but uh, uh, the range was much longer. But uh, what, what I would like to, to say is that um, uh, those uh, Sherman tanks were much more, much more uh, they were faster and they were mass produced, that's the most, uh, that's something very important. You know, when, when one uh, Sherman tank was destroyed, uh, two, maybe three were uh, landing every single day. Uh, by the end of June, uh, the Americans were able to uh, uh, unload uh, hundreds of tanks like this. So I'm not saying it was not a big deal if one was destroyed, but uh, uh, in Germany, on the other hand, when, was, when one, when one uh, German tank was destroyed, they were done, you know, they were, um, everything was over. So now we are just 
living as you uh, can see the World War II area. And I will uh, take you, uh, this is, I'm almost done. I just want, I just have uh, to hold your attention for, for two minutes. And I have a few words to share with you, a few words about this uh, circular cinema right here. This is uh, one of the one of the theaters where you can spend uh, half an hour. That's one of the movies that is shown. Film last uh, 90 minutes, runs every uh, runs every 30 minutes, every half hour. As um, you can see, thank you, Laura. We are now uh, about to uh, enter the uh, area dedicated to the Cold War. We, we won't have time, of course, but uh, I just want to, uh, you to have a look. Oh, hang on. Wait a second. We need to do everything in this museum. I'm sorry. Can you still hear me, uh, Tiana? Yes, perfectly. Excellent. So this is uh, just a few words about this World War II, uh, this World War II. So this uh, Cold War uh, section, this is a different part of the museum as well. But guess what? Those two uh, pieces of the wall are the uh, pieces of the Berlin Wall which both have been given by the mayor of Berlin himself right after 1989. And I guess you did notice the, uh, the, the, the drawings representing the, the rabbits. Rabbits was the only um, uh, animal that was uh, representing freedom, liberty. Uh, thanks to digging tunnels, he was able to go on either way, east and west of Berlin. Wow. So that's obviously uh, symbolizing the end of the uh, Cold War uh, section. Thank for you. your information, my, no problem. For your information, Tiana, you can also spend two, three hours in that section. I will, I will. This is also interesting. I I mean, I could go over for hours still, but I, I know you have, <laughs> you don't have unlimited hours. Let's see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how much time do we have left, uh, Tiana? Yeah, uh, a few minutes to to uh, to see what you have uh, as a okay. temporary exhibit, and then we'll we close yep. there. <laughs> I think this part is uh, also interesting for our American guests. Uh, um, when yeah. visiting, and this is a preview because I, I'm not sure if um, if this is going to be uh, available uh, for a while. But no, will last until uh, uh, early March 2000, 2022. So okay. Um, so this is uh, one uh, of the uh, exhibition spaces of the museum. The particularity of this uh, um, of this space is that it. It is uh, a space for temporary uh, exhibition. So this is one of our temporary exhibition. According to what I said, it will last. This one will last uh, uh, a few uh, a few more months till uh, early March uh, 2022. But as you can see, this is an exhibition of the 9/11. For your information, I mean, this is again for the Americans. Uh, we, first of all, we don't want you to uh, to feel uh, left out. We don't ha not only have a. a uh, things uh, in the World War II section, but we have also here an exhibition. Uh, for your information, this is the second time that we we, we got this type of exhibition. Uh, we did the exact same type of exhibition ten years after the, after 2000, uh, 2001 in partnership with the New York State Museum, and uh, now we have uh, for the very for the for the second time a, a different type of exhibition, and that will last again until uh, March two thousand twenty two. Uh, the idea of this exhibition is to tell you that the world we live in right now is actually the world uh, of 9/11. You know, we're just uh, that's just legacies. That just uh, uh, we're just uh, yeah, that, that's just the way it is. We we're living after the 9/11, uh, so we don't have obviously uh, lots of uh, uh, ruins or or, or, or things like this. Uh, we do have actually some uh, some stuff uh, given by the uh, New York State Museum on display here. But to be honest, we'll have to uh, go down, and it's uh, quite far away from where we are. I think we are running out late already. So uh, one of the uh, last, very last thing, and you, and I will uh, set you free uh, 
uh, dear visitors, is that uh, these are some of the news. The idea uh, of the of the curator of this exhibition is to make people understand that 9/11 was obviously a, uh, an, uh, a shock for the for the whole world. And these are some of the pictures that were, that were actually taken all over the world in every uh, different countries, uh, whether you live in France, America, or wherever you live, uh, everywhere in the world, uh, uh, there were headlines the very next day uh, covering uh, this, uh, this tragedy. Uh, well, Fantastic. That's, it. that's it for me. Thank you so much, Olivier. So this, uh, the war, uh, sorry, the 9-11 exhibit is available until March. So, uh, well, I think, you know, uh, we're going to invite you all to, to visit Normandy and and the Memorial Museum to to both uh, to both learn uh, about um, you know uh, the tw the 20th century history, the D Day, and 9/11. Thank you so much, uh, Olivier, for uh, this. Really, this visit has been so uh, informative, beautiful experience. And I think uh, I think our uh, friends with us are sharing the same sentiment here. Uh, it was Excellent. really uh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, and Roni said very informative and heart, heart wrenching. So that's true. So. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, As you can see, I really enjoyed my time. Uh, it's, yes. uh, it's more than a job for me. It's, uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm a, I mean, uh, I was telling you, I don't, I don't know if I did tell you, but I'm a citizen of, I mean, I, were, I was, uh, I was born in Caen, so I'm a native from Caen, and I'm a citizen uh, of Caen, and I grew up in this, uh, in this countryside, and I guess that's one of the reasons why I am. Um, Yes, we, we, we can hear your passion and uh, not, it's really wonderful to hear. Uh, it's uh, one, <laughs> Olivia, one last question from Gail. Yeah. Uh, she is wondering if the museum is wheelchair uh, friendly, is yeah. it accessible? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we have wheelchair. We can actually provide them with wheelchair. Uh, we have lift uh, throughout the whole building, throughout the whole museum. Uh, you can ask for some assistance as well. Um, you can have your personal guide, as you, as I said earlier. So yeah, no problem at all. All right. So if we have, a, um, if we don't have any more questions, so we posted uh, on the comments all the information from the memorial, the memorial de Caen, the Caen Memorial. If you want to reach out to Olivier. And, and the team over there um, and visit Normandy. Uh, and also you can go to Normandy Tourism uh, if you want to have more information or maybe build a, an itinerary around your uh, World War II um, a trip to, to Normandy. Um, so, sorry. I uh, in, in the meantime, I want to say thank you to everyone thank you olivier so much for one the wonderful insight thank you laura for it's been a pleasure the, the wonderful <laughs> the one by the way do you want to see the laura's face yes of course yeah, yes, laura, thank you thank you so much for today this Bye -bye. was wonderful was really nice. And thank, thank you. you no thank you Valerie from the Normandy tourism for coordinating with us uh, uh, thank you everyone <laughs> oh, she's over there yes so um, thank you all and we'll see you next week we're going to go to Bordeaux and do a UNESCO tour of Bordeaux so tune in to next week on Wednesday uh, with us I hope to see you all merci merci à tous à bientôt Au revoir. Merci. Can I ask you a, a, a last, fa a, a last favor, uh, Tiana? Absolutely. Send my respect to uh, and my hugs to Natalie and uh, Anne Laure, please. Yes, and I'm sure they can hear it. So, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Hopefully, see you soon, Olivier, in, in France or right. in New York. Bye. Absolutely. Bye bye. Bye bye.